Okay. This is U.S. History Third Hour, the ninth day of January. Um, the Do purpose of the Dawes Act, it was called the Dawes Severalty Act, and, and the purpose of the Dawes Act was to uh, separate or sever or cut off Native Americans from their culture. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that many of you are Native Americans and you can't speak a word of the language of the tribe that you are a member of. Uh, it was an attempt to destroy the Native American religion. It was an attempt to destroy their language, the way that they dressed, their culture at large. The idea was, very racist idea, but the idea was, uh, you know, we uh, will change these Native Americans into white men and women in every sense except their skin color. We can't do anything about that, but we can uh, 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 assimilate them into white culture. And that's uh, what the, uh, the uh, Dawes Act did. And it also gave land allotments. And here's the whole thing. I don't know how well I explained this the other day, and I'm not gonna labor very long here. But what it said was, married people who signed up with the Dawes Commission and got a CDIB card. We talked about all that, yes. They got 160 acres. Uh, single people got 80. Well, so some guy here, young guy, single, gets 80 acres. He said, I don't want to farm. I don't want to do that backbreaking work. I want to do something else. Well, he could sell his 80 acres to another Native American, or he could sell it to a white, okay? The point is, is that this land right here in eastern Oklahoma was promised to the Native Americans as long as the water flowed and the grass grew. Well, the last time I checked, the water was still flowing and the grass was still growing. Uh, and of course, most of Eastern Oklahoma is controlled by uh, non-Indian, uh, non-Indian people. Well, how did that happen? You know, if that treaty said as long forever, uh, here's how it happened. Some Native Americans sold their land to uh, whites. Some Native Americans sold their land back to the tribe and the tribe sold it to whites or other Native Americans. One of the things that the Dawes Commission does is that it uh, says, it said this, it said, if you owned 160 acres and you died and you said, I'm gonna leave that to my son, uh, the Dawes Act gave the power to uh, the government to decide whether or not, whoever, are you with me? Whoever you were willing that land to was competent. So if I were a Native American, I'm not, but if I were a Native American and I was in 1880 uh, or 1887 uh, and uh, I owned land and I had a son and I willed it to that son, that, that son didn't automatically get that land. The Dawes Commission essentially or the U.S. government decided whether or not my son would be competent to own that land. And if they said, yeah, he's competent, he got to keep the land. But if they said he's not competent, they might sell that land to a railroad or they might sell that land to an oil company. You with me? And that's how uh, this promise that uh, this part of Oklahoma in which we live would be the home of the land of the Native Americans as long as the water flowed to the grass. That's how that came, began to come to uh, an end, okay? So I hope you understand that about the Dawes, the Dawes uh, Commission. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, I, I just want to say this too. Interestingly enough, the five civilized tribes, uh, did we talk about the McGirt case? Did we talk, okay. Well, I'm just trying to find, huh? I don't remember it, but it Jim C. McGirt. Well, very quickly, but you know, you know, just, just, you know, what does all this mean today? Well, look, uh, the five civilized tribes, and there were many different tribes here in Oklahoma, but the five civilized tribes um, had been exempt from the original, just think about this, from, from the original Dawes Act, because uh, the, um, because the, the government uh, had, um, had um, recognized the five civilized tribes as independent nations. I don't want to get too twisted up here, and too detailed, but so when the five civilized tribes come here, they have a promise that this land will be theirs forever. And so therefore they established their own court system. The Native American committed a crime. He wasn't tried in a white court necessarily. He was tried in 
uh, a court uh, that that uh, the Cherokee Nation uh, had established. But uh, in 1898, what well, my point is is that that uh, the 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 Dawes Act did not apply at first to the five civilized tribes. Okay, so all matters concerning land was decided by the tribe itself because the government had negotiated with the five civilized tribes as independent nations. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yes. You understand what I'm talking about? Okay. But in 1898, all that changed for the five civilized tribes because the Congress passed a law called the Curtis Act. Okay. The Curtis Act. Let me see here. I've got these a little out of order. <coughs> The Curtis Act, and it was named after this man, writing down Charles Curtis, who was a U.S. senator, a Republican from Kansas. And in fact, he was a Native American. He was a member of the Kansa tribe. You know, where does the word Kansas come from? Well, there it is, the Kansa tribe. He was a Native American. He was not a full blood. He was a mixed blood. But he proposed the Curtis Act. Get this down. And the Curtis Act was an amendment, an addition to the Dawes Act. Here you have the Dawes Act in 1887. Eleven years later, you have the Curtis Act, which amends or changes or adds to the uh, Dawes Act. And here's what it said. Here's what... The Curtis Act said it abolished tribal courts. If these Cherokees have been running their own court system no more. If a Cherokee commits a crime, he will be tried or she will be tried in a federal court. That's This sounds pretty technical, but that is a big deal. That profoundly affects the lives of Native Americans to this very day. And also, get this down, the Curtis Act <clears throat> divided, for the first time, divided the lands of the five civilized tribes. They divided the lands of the five civilized tribes, just like they had divided the land, 160 acres and 80 acres. Are you with me? You understand that? Yes? Okay. And number three, they abolished the court system. <clears throat> They um, divide the land into allotments. And number three, they enroll the tribes. They enroll the five civilized tribes to determine who was a full blood and who was a mixed blood, who was a tribal citizen, who was not, and to determine the degree of Indian blood and any, that each person had. And everyone who signed up got a CDIB card. And several of you have a CDIB card. Some of you may be Native Americans. I teach Native Americans all the time uh, that do not have a CDIB card. Uh, they're not considered necessarily a citizen of the Creek Nation or the Seminole Nation because their ancestor back in 1898 uh, or 1888, their ancestor, when it was time to enroll, to go to the Dawes Commission and sign up, they refused, they refused to do it for a lot of reasons. Some were simply suspicious. They said, you know, we don't trust the government. Uh, others were followers of uh, this man. Have we written down Chino Harjo? We and he led a rebellion right here in Oklahoma, okay? <clears throat> well, but that's Charles Kurtz, uh, the one who, um, who uh, proposed and got passed the, 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 the act named after him, which is the Curtis Act, okay? Uh, so, uh, interestingly enough, I guess the point that I'm heading to, interestingly enough, McGirt versus the United States, have we done that? I have it written down here, but Jim C. Huh? Jim C.? Yeah, did I tell you about that? I have that written down. Okay, well, just let me review it real quick. McGirt, you know, this, all these things I'm talking about that happened in the 1880s and 90s, you know, people often say, well, why study history? Why should we be worried about Charles Curtis? In 1898, he's dead and gone. That whole society's dead and gone. There's nobody that was alive at the time. They're all dead. What does it have to do with us? Well, here's another example. 
of how history has a lot to do with us. But uh, in 2020, just a couple of years ago, uh, a man named uh, Seminole, uh, named Jim C. McGirt, who lived out at Holdenville, Oklahoma, was uh, sentenced to life in prison in a Oklahoma courtroom, not a tribal court, in an Oklahoma courtroom, because there are no more tribal courts in an Oklahoma courtroom for, uh, and by the way, they gave him two sentences of 500 years each, okay? Because in 1997, he had sexually abused his four-year-old step-granddaughter in Wagner, Oklahoma, in Wagner, Oklahoma, on an almost daily basis. It was absolutely horrible. So he sentenced to these two 500-year sentences. His lawyer, though, argued this in court, that that crime that Jim C. McGirt had committed had been done on tribal land and therefore could not be, could not be uh, tried in an Oklahoma court. In other words, what he was saying was that the Dawes Act, as it was amended in 1898, was unconstitutional. And this case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said this, McGirt cannot be tried in an Oklahoma court because the crime he committed was on tribal land. He has to be tried in a federal court. You with me? Not an Oklahoma court, but a federal court. <clears throat> And he was tried in 2021 in a federal court. And he was again found guilty. And he was again sentenced to life without parole. But the Supreme Court in that case, I just want you to understand this, the Supreme Court in that case ruled that the Dawes Act in its original version had never abolished the Indian nations of Oklahoma. The five civilized tribes, the court said, are still independent nations. And so the state of Oklahoma could not try a Native American for a crime committed on Native American land. Okay. Pretty, pretty profound. Pretty, and that, that ruling is in effect. That ruling is in effect today. And it all goes back to the Dawes Act. I'm just pointing out to you that in 2021, the Supreme Court still dealing with the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act in many ways are a lot, is alive and well. And here's, and that's, by the way, did I tell you that in 1928, Charles Curtis, a Kansas Native uh, India, a Kansas Native American, was elected vice president of the United States. He's the first, and so far the only, but he's the first Native American ever to serve as vice president of the United States, okay? Interesting, interesting. And there's, <laughs> there he is up close. And uh, this woman too, this woman too, you know, uh, while you're on break, the 100, and that's misspelled. Or no, that's correct, okay, T -E, okay, two, four E's, okay. Um, while you were out on break, the Congress, the 118th U.S. Congress assembled. Yes, the Congress is starting its new term now. They just had this big debacle over who was going to be the speaker. Okay, so they got that sorted out, and now the Congress is underway. But for the first time, this woman uh, from Tahlequah, I believe she's from Tahlequah, Oklahoma, Kimberly Teehee, she is a Cherokee. She's a Cherokee. And the Cherokee Nation, for the first time, will send the first Native American delegate to the U.S. Congress. Now, she's not a member of the Congress. She cannot vote uh, but she uh, on a bill, but she can sit on committees that help shape bills, uh, and she can uh, join in the debate. Uh, and for the first time, you say, well, for the first time, because on December 29th, 1835, the Cherokees, some of them, and I'm not going to get into this right now, but some of the Cherokees signed a treaty 
with the U.S. government called the Treaty of New Ashota. That was in 1830, 1835, New Ashota, Georgia. You probably remember this from your Oklahoma history. New Ashota, Georgia. And in, and in, in the Treaty of uh, New Ashota, the Cherokees agreed to give up their land in Georgia in exchange for land in Oklahoma. And part of the promise on the part of the U.S. government was, if you will give up your land in Georgia and move to Indian Territory, we will allow the Cherokee Nation to send a delegate, a non-voting delegate, to the U.S. Congress. Never happened until now, until this month, just a few days ago, uh, she took her seat as the first um, Cherokee delegate. And of course, I'm sure the other Native American uh, five civilized tribes, at least, are looking at their treaties with the United States government that may say the same thing. But I just want to, to point, that, point that out to you because, uh, you know, that's a, a landmark uh, thing. You know, the United States controls Puerto Rico as a commonwealth. Well, the Puerto Rican, the nation of Puerto, or the island nation of Puerto Rico, they send delegates to the Congress. We have places like Guam and other places the United States controls, uh, and uh, they are allowed to send delegates to the U.S. Congress. Well, here's the latest delegate, a young lady from Tahlequah, Oklahoma, Kimberly T. Okay, Kimberly T. Well, uh, so I want to make sure you understand that. Well, the boarding schools. Let's go to the boarding schools real quick. I've got these a little out of order as usual. But anyway, uh, you know, the Dawes Act, the main purpose of the Dawes Act was to assimilate Native Americans into white culture. Here's a perfect example of the boarding school experience. There's a young man when he arrives, uh, a Navajo, uh, Tom Tolling, I think that says. But there he is. And of course, there he is after he gets to uh, the boarding schools. Uh, Indian children were rounded up. Here's another picture, I think maybe more dramatic than that. Here they are when they step off the train. Henry Standing Bear, wounded yellow robe, and Chauncey yellow robe. Uh, here they are when they step off the train um, uh, at the boarding school. And here they are shortly after they arrive at the boarding school. You know, the U.S. government... The government looked at the older Native Americans and said, hey, they're too set in their ways. They're never, we're never going to be able to assimilate them into uh, white culture. But if we can uh, assimilate the young into white culture, we will have accomplished our mission. Uh, and uh, no doubt about it, the purpose of the boarding schools was to destroy Native American culture. Again, language, religion, dress, uh, and a host of other things. So the government, they're going to send out people to round up, literally kidnap uh, Native American children. All, I mentioned Puerto Rico, all the way from Puerto Rico to Hawaii. Okay, And like I say, Oklahoma had the most of these schools, 76 right here in Oklahoma. They were given English names. First thing off the, you know, they're, they're given English names. They were forbidden to speak the Native American language. They cut their hair which is so important and symbolic in native culture. They cut their hair. Uh, they did away with the practice of the native religion and literally forced Christianity on them. Uh, and of course, all the children went to school half a day in the morning and in the afternoon, uh, they were, the boys were taught a trade like blacksmithing or carpentry or farming. And the girls did things like sewing and laundry. Uh, they had a guard. These children tried to run away. What a horrible experience that must have been, you know, to be in Montana with your parents and in the dark of the night, you're picked up, put on a train. And the next time your feet touch the ground, you're in Pennsylvania. You have no idea. It's like sending you to Mars. Uh, and uh, some of the children tried to run away and they had uh, guards and guard houses. They literally chained young Native American kids to the walls of these guard houses to prevent them from running away. It was a horrible, horrible experience. And by the way, right now, again, you know, all this old stuff happened. Right now, the U.S. government has launched an investigation. It's very active here in Oklahoma about abuses at these boarding schools. One of the most famous schools uh, was in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Got this down, the Carlisle Boarding School. Carlisle <clears throat> Industrial School. Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Bo uh, industrial school. 
and one of its most fam famous, maybe the most famous graduate, get this man down, Jim Thorpe. His name was Watho Huck. He's a Sac and Fox Indian, Sac and Fox Native American, Watho Huck. His name meant Bright Path. <clears throat> And he was from Yale, Oklahoma. Have any of you ever been to Yale, Oklahoma? Yale. If you go up to an OSU football game, I think you go right past Yale. In the old days, you went through it. Any of you been to Yale? Probably. Yeah, just south of Stillwater. Just a nice little town about like you fall. Well, that's where, that's where uh, Jim Thorpe was from. And he is considered by many <clears throat> to be the greatest athlete that ever lived. In fact, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, I believe, to this day, uh, every year, uh, awards the uh, Jim Thorpe Award to the best defensive back in professional football. In 2000, which has been 21 years ago, they probably have revised this list. I don't know. Uh, but uh, in 2000, the Sports Writers of America were asked, all the Sports Writers of America were asked to name the three greatest athletes that ever played sports. And who did they name? Obviously, Jim Thorpe is one of them. Who are the other two? Tom Brady. Who? Tom Brady. No, but that's an educated guess. It's Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, number two. Who's number three? Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. There you go. Well, two out of three ain't bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, but Jim Thorpe. Yeah, Jim Thorpe. Uh and by the way, uh, he did, Jim Thorpe, in addition to football and basketball and track, he also played semi-pro baseball. That's just something to stick in your head. Semi-pro baseball, not professional ball. No, he never made it to the big league. He did professional ball, but he played semi-pro. Uh, and in 1912, he went to the Olympics to represent the United States. And he won two gold medals. Most people strive and strive and train and train and never win one. He won two. But after he had been awarded those medals, the Olympic Committee <clears throat> took them back because they said that uh, Thorpe had played professional baseball, which was wrong. He had not. He played semi-pro ball. You understand that, <clears throat> and of course this is going away, but the Olympics, is, it's supposed to be a contest not between professional athletes, but just ordinary people who train, uh, non-professional athletes are supposed to participate in the uh, Olympics, but that's that's changing like everything else in sports, I guess. But anyway, he won those two gold medals. I think I've got a, there's a picture of Jim Thorpe. He, he did a lot of things. He'll be in the movies, and, but there is two gold medals. They took those away. They, they took those away and uh, but eventually, and, not, and his family never gave up. His family said, you know, that's an injustice. He won those medals. He should have. And they never gave up. And in 1983, they uh, awarded, they returned uh, Jim Thorpe's medals. And I, I, they may be over in the uh, Oklahoma History Center or the state, the state capitol uh, somewhere. But anyway, I need to look that up. But they, uh, his medals were restored. Okay. Well... <clears throat> So, as a result of the Dawes Act, <clears throat> get this down, slowly but surely, <clears throat> white settlers, oil companies, <clears throat> rail companies uh, got possession of more and more Native American land. And I want you to write this date down and remember it. On April 22nd, 1889, <clears throat> April 22nd, 1889. The Oklahoma land run took place. Get this down. The Oklahoma land run took place. Because, <clears throat> look at this. There's the Choctaw Nation. You live in the Creek Nation. There's the Cherokee Nation, Cherokee Outlet, <clears throat> the Chickasaw Nation, and there are the Seminoles, okay? And then you see Sac and Fox, Iowa, and the Western Plains tribes here. But right in the middle, after all these tribes are settled here, right in the middle of what is today the state of Oklahoma, get this down, was a piece of land called the unassigned lands. Write that down. It, it had not been, you see it? You can see it a little better right there. <clears throat> the unassigned lands. 
<clears throat> that had not been assigned to any Native American tribe. If you go to an OU football game, you're sitting in the old <clears throat> unassigned lands. We're pretty close to it. And there were 2 million acres right in the middle of Oklahoma that no one owned. No tribe had been assigned. And so what the government will do in 1889 is that it divided the unassigned lands into six, get this down, 6,000. They divided that up into 6,000, sent surveyors down there. And they divided that up into 6,160 acre farms, 6,160 acre farms or homesteads. And then they put out the word, Anybody who comes here, anyone who comes here, we're going to have this land run on April 22nd. And, the, and the, 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 this was published in newspapers overseas. People came from all over the world to participate in the great Oklahoma land run. And uh, they said, you know, anyone that comes here, you have a chance of winning 160 acres. What if we set aside 2 million acres of land somewhere in this country and we just put out the word, Anybody that comes and participates, you have a chance of winning 160 acres of land. You suppose any people would show up? Yes, they would come out of the woodwork. Well, they did here too. 12,000 people show up. Think about that. There are only 6,000 homesteads and 12,000, at least 12,000 and probably more show up. <clears throat> and when you came, you had to register and you had to pay a fee. And when you paid a fee, they gave you a stake with a number on it. And of course, all out there, those 6,000 uh, homesteads, they had a stake in the middle with a number on that as well. And uh, anyway, <clears throat> the race began at noon. Like I say, 12,000 people show up. People gathered for weeks and weeks, maybe months. I need to read up on that, but maybe months. And they camped and lawyers were there. They set up tents to record the deeds uh, all along the north end of the unassigned lands. And then on April 22nd, 1889, you know, a pistol was fired, a cannon was fired. <clears throat> There's a picture, okay? April 22nd, 1889. Biggest land run in American history. Biggest land run in American history. Oh, I've got my pictures right. Uh, you know, they take a lot of these old photographs and they doctor them up. They clear them up through some process. I don't know. Oops. But, uh, there we go. There we go. And by the way, the watch, you know, it started at 12 noon, and the watch that the Army officer was holding like this with his hand up to signal fire the pistol, it's over in the Oklahoma History Center, and it's set at 12 noon. They stopped it at 12 noon. It's set there, and you can go over You can go over and see the watch that the guy was holding and kicked off the Oklahoma land run. And people, you know, used every conveyance. Some people said, I'm going to run. I, you know, I, I'm going to run. Uh, you know, I can just go faster. I'm not going to go in a wagon or a carriage. Uh, <clears throat> some people rode bicycles, okay? That's an actual photo right there. And they actually built a train track through, and you could buy a ticket on a train, and, you know, you're chugging along there. You see a piece of land you want, I guess, bail off the train, okay? I'm sure there were some broken collarbones and broken arms. Of course, some people went in early, okay? Some people went in early. <clears throat> you know, uh, they sneaked across. They went and paid their fee and they got their stake. Because the deal is, is you're right out there and you see the piece of land you want, you're going to pull up the stake, okay, that stake with that number on it. And you're going to drive your stake in there so this has been claimed. And then you're going to ride back just as fast as you can to one of those attorneys up there and you're going to say, I want to register that as mine on a deed. And they would write out a deed in that number and that was yours. Understand that? That's what it worked. A lot of people went in weeks before. The army, they send the cavalry, and the cavalry's crisscrossing the unassigned lands trying to root out these guys that cheated that went in early. And they look at this, and there's some timber over there, there's some water. They've got their maybe little calendar with them, and they just sit down, <clears throat> hide out in the woods. Uh, and on April 22nd, they just step out and pull up the stake, claim it, and go. They meet every, you know, as they're heading back to the law, they meet everybody coming south, okay? <clears throat> what were those people called? Sooners. Sooners. Write that down. And to the chagrin of all OSU fans, 
Oh, you, excuse me, the state of Oklahoma is called the Sooner State. I'm sure they would like to change that, <clears throat> but the Sooner State. And we have a university here, the Oklahoma Sooners. <clears throat> well, in one day, they settled 2 million acres of land in one day. I have read historians who say that most people who participated in the land run, I think it's true, most didn't get any land. And where did they go? They went on to Texas. They went south. Just went right, just kept going. Okay. <clears throat> and so Oklahoma Territory, get this down. And see what we're discussing here is how beginning with the Dawes Act, this land that had been set aside for the Native Americans forever ends up in the possession of whites, the federal government, the state of Oklahoma will come out of this land road because Oklahoma Territory was created right here in the heart, in the heart of Indian, uh, Indian, so-called Indian territory. And by the way, write this date down too, 18 years later, 18 years after this initial land run, and there are many land drawings and there are other land runs, but none are as big as this. 18 years later, Oklahoma became a state. On, and I want you to write down the date of statehood, November 16th, 1907. <clears throat> November 16th, 1907. And Oklahoma turned 100 years old in your lifetime. Okay. Yeah, probably had a, what grade were you all at in 2007? Could be one years old. I, you I was just born. You're one? I was, I was one. just born. You were born? I was one. When? What is your birth date? November 13th, 2006. Wow. You made it by three days. Congra <laughs> you made it just under the wire. Congratulations. You were all around on November 16th, 2007, weren't you? James, barely. <laughs> well, very good. Well, so you were around. You didn't know what was going on. You were laying in the crib, sucking on a pacifier, but uh, Oklahoma became a state. November 16th, 1907. And uh, the 100th anniversary was November the 16th. I don't know why I thought you people would have been older, but anyway, yeah. Time's creeping up on me. Anyway, you know, and I want to say this too. Get this down. Then uh, a group of Native Americans, a group of Native Americans, uh, tried to create an all Indian state in eastern Oklahoma. Okay, instead of this being one state, they said we'll have two states. One will be an Indian nation state, and the western part of Oklahoma will be, um, well, I mean, kind of like this. Let me go back to a map here. Will be the state of Oklahoma. Well, that's not good. This will be an Indian state, well, Indian state, and this will be the state of Oklahoma. And they actually had a convention. Get this down. They actually had a convention. Uh, <clears throat> And they, in Muskogee, uh, in 1905, and it's called the Sequoia Convention, okay? The Sequoia Convention, named after the great uh, Cherokee. His name was George Guess. He was illiterate. He couldn't read and write, but through sound, he wrote the Cherokee language, the Cherokee alphabet. And, and by the way, he's one of the four Oklahomans. They have a big painting of Sequoia over in the rotunda of the state capitol. Okay. But anyway, the Sequoia, they were going to name this Indian state the state of Sequoia. Uh, but, of course, they never had rallied enough support for that. The government wasn't behind it. And so when Indian Territory became a state, it became the state of Oklahoma. And some people say that that Oklahoma it comes is derived from a Choctaw word. It's kind of like they say the word Mississippi is an old creek, you know, mean father of the waters. Who knows? Uh, but uh, an old Choctaw word meaning red earth. Okay. And if you go just a little bit west of here, <clears throat> yeah, I was raised in the red earth country. The dirt is red, very rich too, but it, it's red, red earth and oak. Some, you know, that may just be mythology. But anyway, what was Indian territory became Oklahoma. Now, 
the whole, get this down, the whole, sorry, this is where we'll take it up tomorrow, the whole, whole, or the entire sorry episode known as the Indian Wars that we've been talking about. I hope you understand them a little better now. I hope you know more than you, you do by watching Westerns on television. But uh, the whole Indian Wars episode will come to an end in 1890. You know, Geronimo had surrendered in 1886, and everybody said, well, it's over. Well, it wasn't quite over. Uh, and it will uh, come to an end at a place called Wounded Knee. Get this down. Wounded Knee in South Dakota. And that's where we will take it up come tomorrow. And don't forget your essay test.